Hello, I'm Andrew Mazzoni, president of the Henry George School of Social Science. Welcome to Smart Talk. On this program, we discuss and debate controversial topics with leading economists and social scientists. Our goal is to explore diverse opinions on the economic state of the world. Today's guest joining us via Skype is Eamon Fingleton. Mr. Fingleton has written extensively on global economics and globalism with a particular focus on Japan and China. He is a former editor for the Financial Times and Forbes. Well, Eamon, welcome to Smart Talk. Thanks for coming aboard. We're going to, we're going to of, course, of course, talk about your specialty, which is Asian and American economic interactions and the implications. So uh, <clears throat> let me just say to the audience, Abel Fingleton was one of the first to sound the alarm about offshoring and what it would do to uh, the long-term prospects of America. And uh, in many ways, uh, he talked on deaf ears, but events have proven him right. Of course, the question ultimately we'll talk about is, why has the establishment and the American people, in effect, been complacent or not understanding about what Eamon had said would happen over the last 30 years. But that's kind of jumping ahead here. So we'll go to the, to the beginning. Eamon, you first started writing about the problems of offshoring and the implications of deindustrializing probably close to 25 years ago. And why did you pick up on it, and what made you be so prescient about the implications. After all, nobody at that time really was, was worried about that. Well, uh, I was in Japan, in Tokyo, and uh, that's a different experience. Um, frankly, unless you've lived in Japan, you have very little sense of, uh, of how that country works and its ambitions and so on. Um, and uh, more generally... Uh, the Japanese experience uh, taught me how the East Asians, the Koreans, the Chinese, the Taiwanese think about these issues. And of course, they are highly export oriented. Um, the real criterion for them is how well they do in trade. Uh, everything else is, is rather uh, secondary. Um, and uh, I picked up on the fact that uh, the Japanese have a very different view of manufacturing from Americans. Um, they, they see manufacturing as the key to their uh, survival and uh, uh, their future uh, prosperity. Americans at that time, and still today it seems, think that um, manufacturing is rather optional uh, and can be offshored without uh, uh, serious damage to, to, to the national interest. All right, let me interject here. I'm an old line manufacturing guy, actually, and I was brought up in manufacturing, uh, worked with some great companies, uh, understood the, uh, the integration of the shop floor, engineering, and all of that, and, and the cumulative effects of learning by doing, all of that was very clear oh, to many of us. Uh, so this wasn't that we were uh, post-industrials ahead of time. As a, as, a, as a manufacturing executive in America, and ended up at a, as a high-ranking one, uh, I understood that this was the key to America's preeminence. And that was proven in World War II, when we were essentially the arsenal of democracy. And uh, so all of a sudden, this shift that occurred, and I witnessed it, and I railed about it, actually, did occur, and it went, it went blithely along. And, and I understand, I did, uh, the fact that the, the Japanese side of desperation, if nothing else, would have to work harder, cheaper, smarter, and learn the lessons of industrialization. In fact, they imported Deming and Duran, quality control experts, to be able to precisely control their manufacturing. And Americans saw this, but I think at, at the time, although we understood the effects and in, in the, in the need for manufacturing, we didn't realize how relentlessly we would be competed against. And I think American policy planners felt we could always maintain a lead, even if we did send some manufacturing offshore. Your comments? Uh, well, all that is um, on the point. I think that uh, people like yourself, Andrew, who uh, were in manufacturing, understood something that the media 
did not understand and uh, the academics did not understand. People like Milton Friedman, uh, the, the great economist, the Nobel Prize winning economist and so on, um, people like that did not understand manufacturing. Um, and uh, specifically, they, they did not understand that, that um, um, if you give all your manufacturing technology away, which has been the effect of free trade, um, then um, you're not going to continue to come up with uh, great new manufacturing ideas. You're going to impoverish your own nation. Okay, but then, of course, the argument would be uh, superficially uh, for the American people, they would, they would take a look at Apple computers, for example, and say, oh, my God, they're innovative, and yet uh, they probably think a lot of the manufacturing is done in the United States, but a lot of it, most of it is done off sh offshore. We're, we're jumping ahead here. And the innovation is, always, is obviously con continuing. And the design innovation is certainly continuing. Yet the deep manufacturing is done in, in, uh, elsewhere, probably China, Korea, assembled in, in, in China. And that deep manufacturing, those processes, we could never do back here, even if we wanted to. Your comments. Well, that, that's absolutely, absolutely correct, that uh, uh, manufacturing is much more advanced uh, than people uh, in um, the media in, in the United States realize. Uh, there's a lot of learning by doing, uh, as you pointed out, um, that there's a lot of uh, um, a, a very capital-intensive work involved. Uh, uh, all, all of this is uh, very sophisticated stuff, um, and uh, when we look at a company like Apple Computer, um, yes, uh, its products uh, are uh, very nice, we all love them, um, but um, most of the value added in these things um, is actually East Asian, and much of it, in, fa in fact, is uh, Japanese. Um, much of the rest is Korean or Taiwanese. Um, uh, an Apple um, I, I, iPhone will come in saying made in China, but actually the Chinese component is probably about 5%. Uh, the Japanese component is close to 30%. Um, and um, uh, the, the Koreans are also there. The Taiwanese are also there. Um, they're all contributing and making a lot of money and more important, they are um, maintaining a lot of high-level jobs uh, that uh, have disappeared from the United States. Okay, manufacturing, of course, always offered a laddering of jobs at various levels, and so America, with a large manufacturing component, could fit people in at various levels of skill and, and uh, create value up and down the, man, the, man, the labor chain, and, of course, this country was built essentially on that, and for for 150 years, uh, especially especially starting with Hamilton in the 1800s, uh, we were smart enough to impose tariffs to protect and build our manufacturing. In fact, we became super powerful behind a tariff wall and with an open uh, enlarged market locally. And uh, that was the case all the way up until World War II and then something changed. Now, I'm going to argue a hypothesis and I, I want you to comment one way or the other. Uh, I think somewhere in the late uh, 1940s, when it was evident that we were going to win the war, that uh, the policy planners in America decided, look, we can't have autarkic growth or powerful manufacturing centers in one, one country and not another. We have America, and Germany tried to, in World War I and World War II, in effect, crowd into that field with its own manufacturing and then engage in a chase for markets. And I think the policy plan is America said, look, we can't, we can't do that. We're not going to de-industrialize Germany, uh, which was, a, which was a, uh, put on the table at the time. But we'll create maybe three capitalist centers so that we can free trade amongst them and uh, spread the wealth and prevent, let's say, a World War III. And if that happened, we, the United States, we think we can still maintain our manufacturing lead because we didn't quite understand you know, what it takes to do that. Well, um, I, I, I think the, the um, thing that's missing from the standard analysis is, is the word jobs. Um, you, you have to look at where the jobs are. 
and uh, in this uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in this uh, global analysis, um, the jobs are not in America anymore. And if you don't have uh, jobs for your middle classes, you, you don't have uh, a, a seriously sustainable economy. Okay, but I, again, I'll take the uh, view from an investment banking point of view. They would probably argue, we get that. We, we understand that. But since we're globalized and our money is good everywhere, we can f pick and choose our markets. We can p pick and choose centers of demand. Uh, we can pick and choose centers of supply. And we can be indifferent to the American situation and still do well. Um, well, uh, Wall, Wall Street it, um, really is not, it seems to me, looking out for the American national interest. So uh, we can set that Wall Street aside. Um, but Wall Street uh, is highly influential in uh, shaping how the media see these issues. Uh, and... Uh, um, Traditionally, uh, the American man manufacturing sector has been extremely uh, limited in its ability to shape um, the um, uh, policy, policy making agenda, the uh, media perception of these issues. Um, and um, it's uh, an interesting debate uh, where the problem is. In my view, uh, the major problem has been the economics profession. Uh, the Nobel Prize week winning economists who have come forward to say, as Milton Friedman said, uh, that it doesn't matter if other countries don't open up to our exports, we still stand to gain from opening up to their, to, to their products. Um, but to me, that, that was... Um, at the time, uh, debatable, and uh, when I look back on it now, uh, it was insane. Baumel and Gomery, uh, two economists, have kind of disproven this simple-minded, simple free trade uh, viewpoint as uh, bordering on asinine. I mean, free trade in the in the in the Ricardian sense has very simple propositions. Capital doesn't uh, emigrate. Uh, uh, technology is relatively similar. A whole host of things that don't apply today. I mean, it's uh, free trade amongst un unequals, uh, labor arbitraging, and all of that is absolutely absolutely fatal for the country that that engages in it and gives up its vital manufacturing. But to make the point really clear, you're an expert on the outsourcing of industries and what some of the some of the aspects and dangers of that uh, are. For example, your description of Boeing and its outsourcing uh, of one of the most important and vital industries. You've, you've done detailed analysis of what that has meant and how irreversible it almost has become and how dangerous has it become. Would you like to comment on, on the Boeing experience, first off? Well, um, Boeing has a strong relationship with, demand, with Japan. Uh, uh, the Japanese uh, will buy um, Boeing planes, but on condition that with each new uh, Boeing plane, the more of the work will be done in Japan. Um, uh, the result is that the 787, which is the, the, the most recent Boeing and the most advanced passenger plane ever built, um, is in significant measure a Japanese plane. It's basically probably more now a Mitsubishi than a Boeing. Uh, the wings are made in Japan by Mitsubishi and the wings are uh, absolutely key to a plane. Um, they are in many ways the most advanced uh, part of a plane because they have to be very, very strong, but they also have to be very, very light uh, and they have to be um, very responsive to controls, etc., etc. Um, the, the wings of the 787 are made in Japan they're made in significant measure of um, carbon fiber, which is a Japanese uh, uh, strength. The counter to all this is uh, people like Robert Reich had, had elo eloquently described the symbolic post-industrial economy where we would <coughs> not worry about the, the nitty-gritty of manufacturing. and In effect, we would be idea people 
selling ideas to the rest of the world and uh, while they did the uh, uh, dirty work. And that was uh, a big uh, big thing to tranquilize uh, Americans during this, uh, uh, this transfer phase. Why didn't it work out? Well, um, it's all very well to talk about ideas and to talk about writing great software and so on. But um, um, jobs at that level are um, very high-level jobs in terms of the uh, intellectual quality uh, of the people involved. Uh, they are, many, in many cases, PhD-level people. Uh, so uh, what proportion of your population have PhDs is the question. Um, if you want uh, a well-balanced, prosperous economy, you have to have jobs for ordinary people. Okay, but if I look at it, I'll be the devil's advocate here. I think it's pretty clear what you've advocated about manufacturing and what I would agree with in my experience. You can't really give that away. If you want to maintain the integrity of the nation, the ability to have enough purchasing power to, to buy what you make and, and have a balanced economy. But if I look at the world as one large country, and, 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 and I look at it from an investment banking point of view, simply America is just another province that may have good times and bad times, and I'm shifting assets around the world. I, I think the problem is that other countries don't uh, behave in the same way. Um, for them, for a country like China, for instance, um, technology is something you absorb from abroad. Uh, you don't share uh, with other countries unless uh, there's a special reason to do so. You, you have the ability to restrict the flow of your technology abroad and specifically production technology. The technology that's required to ensure that your workers are more productive than the workers of other nations. Um, that sort of um, uh, knowledge, uh, learning by doing very often, um, other countries, uh, Japan, Germany and so on, um, are quite careful to try to maintain within their own uh, borders. Uh, uh, so far, China doesn't have much of that sort of production technology, but going forward, uh, looking at uh, uh, things in the long term, as you've suggested, Ch China will be careful to keep its own production technology at home uh, while sucking in other people's uh, production technology. So it's a, a one-way valve that they, they gain and uh, America loses. Well, that's clear. And, America's, and Americans in the 1800s to the 1900s understood that quite well. Why have they forgotten that lesson? There's got to be a reason. The American people have s sat by, really, and witnessed this and haven't made too much uh, noise about it. I mean, in fact, uh, probably uh, do not realize how dangerous the situation is for their children and grandchildren in terms of economic uh, uh, prospects, because it's true. A Asia, Germany, they will not give up uh, their manufacturing hard-won <clears throat> proprietary knowledge. We've done it blithely <clears throat> and without much outcry. How do you explain the fact that the American people, in effect, sat, sat, sat by, why this occurred, policymakers went along with it, Wall Street certainly loves it, Government uh, people uh, support it, and neoclassical economists basically argue: well, free trade and uh, is the best of all possible worlds. And of course, they don't argue uh, in the Gomery Baumol tradition, where the, the 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 basics of that free trade argument have basically been exploded. Why no uh, real pushback on this? There was a little pushback. There were a few people fighting, and a few groups fighting it. But there's been no real pushback. Certainly the presidents of the United States are not pushing back in any real sense. Obama is not pushing back. Clinton is not pushing back. The Bushes were not pushing back. Uh, where was the understanding of America's national interests left? In whose hands are they to allow this process? Or is it, or is it my theory that becoming international, it's like Rome. You can move the center of operations to wherever you, wherever you want to, and national interests are really not of primary concern. 
I think the issue goes back to the economists. Um, they said the free trade uh, would work irrespective of whether other countries uh, reciprocated. Um, and their underlying assumption to the extent that they really thought this through was that America would keep coming up with new uh, inventions, uh, new production processes, so that uh, even if under conditions of one-way free trade, America's existing uh, production processes went abroad to help other countries export into the uh, American market, there would always be new American production technologies that would keep America ahead. Coming, uh, from, coming from where? If you take your shop floor and your engineering away, they don't come from anywhere. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Andrew, but uh, that, that this was the assumption, I think, that uh, uh, drove uh, the American intellectual community, particularly uh, in the relevant period, I suppose, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, when they uh, thought that uh, free trade would be um, a huge benefit to the United States and, and to the world in general. Um, uh, I think that even people like Paul Krugman are now beginning to ask questions about whether free trade is a great idea. Well, I'll take a counter uh, position here. If you take a look at the income distributions in America, there's a, a tremendous amount of wealth being made in by relatively few people. They would argue free trade has to be great. Look at what it's done for us. Your, your arguments, though, are obviously the most pers per persuasive, especially if your books are, are read. And, in fact, the detail that you go explaining how industry after industry has been lost and how it's going to be very difficult to, to get it back, especially when these countries who get these industries won't give them back. What do you think the outlook of, of America is, especially the average America, now that the, 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 uh, the horse is out of the barn here? Well, you mentioned that a lot of uh, people have made a lot of money from free trade. That, 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 that's true. Uh, but um, America has always had rich people, uh, very rich people. Uh, we go back to, for instance, in the 19th century, late 19th century, we, we had uh, John D. Rockefeller, we had uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, early 20th century, uh, Henry Ford. Um, so yeah, I, I think that people, the fact that people uh, in the modern era have become very, very wealthy is not really directly related to to free trade because uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, America was one of the most protectionist economies in the world uh, and yet uh, it built um, these huge fortunes. Uh, so uh, to that extent, I think the logic doesn't follow. But um, uh, going forward, it's, it, 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 uh, I would have thought that um, the issue is that uh, the American press is not focusing on uh, the problems with free trade. Okay, and, uh, and there's no, no obvious thing to make them focus other than the fact that it's getting harder and harder to employ the American people. But the American people themselves don't seem to understand what has happened here, which is the strangest thing of all. There's now a dim appreciation, I think, that somehow free trade wasn't good, but the linkages are not clear as to what they are. In fact, the American people are basically told, go get more education and get smarter and somehow things will work better for you. Your, your, your comment on that? Well, in my 1999 book about uh, the new economy versus the old economy, um, software and things like that, versus manufacturing, um, I pointed out that um, uh, many of the new economy uh, businesses are actually highly labor intensive, which means that countries with low labor costs are uh, disproportionately competitive in these industries. So for instance, in software, India, uh, Russia are highly competitive in, in uh, creating routine software. Um, and they've taken a lot of jobs away from, from uh, Americans who uh, have their PhDs and all the rest of it. But um, they can't compete with um, Russian labor costs, um, Indian labor costs. Um, so th 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 there's a big problem there. Okay. So basically, 
if we take your viewpoint and my viewpoint, the American people are cornered in a way, economically, uh, other than remanufacturing, putting up some tariffs, and trying to build an integrated country all over again. Uh, we, we're doomed to a, a small, rich strata in one hand and, uh, and decimation in the workforce on the other relative to the wages that Americans have gotten used to. And without the manufacturing base to give that, what are the options? Um, well, I, I think it's implied in your question. I, I think that um, uh, the American nation has to look again at the whole idea of free trade uh, and to look again at the advantages of the old system of tariffs. Um, uh, from an American point of view, uh, tariffs worked. Uh, from the point of view of the world as a whole, you can argue that tariffs were not a great idea, but uh, from the point of view of the leading economy of that time, uh, tariffs uh, on balance uh, were, were, were a great benefit. Because the, uh, the other side of this problem, of course, is Asia can't continue to, to rack up great surpluses uh, except when they lend us the money to buy their output, and we can't continue to do that. So at the end of the day, none of this is going to work from a macro uh, point of view. Any comments on that? It'll probably be another 15, 20 years before all this plays out, but at that point, China will be the world's uh, not only largest manufacturer, but most sophisticated manufacturer. And uh, that, that's, that, 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 that is a worthy goal, and the price in the meantime, in terms of financing American overconsumption, is worth, worth taking. So you mean, at the end of the day, though, when they're in the position that we were, you don't expect them to give it back like we did? No, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that the Chinese have uh, uh, a much more... Um, ethnic view of the world. Uh, they don't believe in immigration, for instance. Uh, um, they um, um, see a, a, a much clearer divide between their society and other societies. Um, essentially, they're isolationist, uh, and they always have been. Well, Eamon, thanks for the interview. Let's do it again. Uh, you're the guy that's put his finger on the problems better than anyone I've ever read. Uh, I'm sorry it's come to this, though, but please join us again on this show when we ask you next time because you've got your finger on the pulse, and we appreciate it here. Thank you, Anna. And that's it for this edition of Smart Talk. In upcoming shows, we will be talking to such renowned economists as Dr. James Galbraith. Dr. Galbraith is a post-Keynesian economist who argues that modern America has fallen prey to a wealthy government-controlling, quote, predatory class. Please post your questions or comments on our website at www.henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Andrew Mazzoni. We will see you again next time.